zone! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No more hangers! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Tattoo, released October 9th, 1981. It was written by Joyce Boonwell, based on a story by Bob Brooks, directed by Brooks, and released by 20th Century Fox. Bob Brooks developed the story and hired Joyce Boonwell to expand it into a screenplay. Brooks intended the story to mark his directorial debut and connected with producer Joseph E. Levine with a $5 million budget for the story, which seems like a lot unless the cast were more expensive than I would have guessed because it takes place largely in one apartment. Yeah. The story has been described by reviewers as a sort of pornographic adaptation of John Fowles' The Collector. It shot mostly in New York and New Jersey with another unit dispatched to Tokyo for the footage that bookends the story. That doesn't seem necessary. Yeah. They were gearing up to shoot just as the 1980 SAG strike went into effect, but secured an interim agreement that prevented the strike from affecting their set by not hiring any actors. No, yeah. that's not true. Bruce Dern was rejected for the part in Alan Alda's Four Seasons that eventually went to Len Carew, and this was his backup gig. The tattoos in the film were designed by frequent Sesame Street magazine illustrator Isidore Seltzer. Paramount sought to distribute the film, but producer Levine would not budge on retaining network and cable rights and accepted a less generous deal with 20th Century Fox that met his requirements. Producer Levine made some edits to the film in secret, and when director Brooks found out, he wrote a letter in protest. Early posters for the film feature a model pictured nude from the neck down and bound around the ankles. They were deemed blatant pornography by feminist group Women Against Pornography, who are unsurprisingly no longer operating under the acronym WAP, W-A-P. <laughs> They organized mass defacings of the film's print campaign, which producer Levine celebrated for the free publicity it brought. Levine also threatened to sue the MTA for eventually removing the 200 posters from the New York City subway, claiming it represented a violation of his freedom of speech. The film was originally set to hit theaters in the fall of 1980, but conflict in the post process pushed its release date a full year back to October of 1981. During the press tour, Bruce Dern claimed, and repeated later in his autobiography, that his sex scene with Maude Adams was not simulated. Adams was quick to refute the claim, and the consequent rift that formed between the two required them to promote the film separately from then on. The headline of the Washington Post review was The Die of the Needle, as an irrelevant reference to Richard Marquand's World War II drama Eye of the Needle in theaters the same year. The movie was a flop right away, and the cable rights that Levine had sought so hard to preserve had proven fairly worthless, because you can't put this on television anyway. Yeah. Dern was granted a Razzie nomination for his part in the film, but the award went to Lone Ranger Clinton Spilsbury. The movie was due for a Blu-ray from Shout Factory, but eventually it was determined that no suitable print of the film survives for a high-res scan, and the release was scrapped. Oh, darn. <laughs> yeah, shucks. That's a bummer. <laughs> no suitable. Nobody cared enough about this movie to keep a print in decent yeah. shape. <laughs> mm -hmm. If there is one in decent shape, it's like in some pervert's closet somewhere anyway. We start with footage of a crowd playing Red Rover in Japan. A line of men have their arms locked, holding back a crowd pressing in. Among the Japanese faces is Bruce Dern in an army uniform taking photographs over the human barrier of some kind of ceremony taking place. We see from his POV that he is documenting the style of the intricate Japanese tattoos of the men performing the ceremony. We dissolve from that to an artist tattooing similar work on Dern's back. He has a full sleeve as well. We dissolve again back to the US where Dern, with his tattoos now completed, provides a similarly styled work on the back of a customer in his own tattoo parlor. Another man in the building asks why he'd want a scary dragon on his back and the customer says it's to scare off the patients at the hospital where he works because he doesn't wear a shirt <laughs> yeah. for his whole shift. The guy's like, don't you wear clothes when you work? And he's like, yeah, but I'd go through naked if I had to. Uh, what? What does that mean? What are you talking about? You don't have to. He's going to find an excuse to take his shirt off. So he can... Yeah. Why Look, a dragon. A guy drew a dragon on my back. 
Why would there be literally anyone in a tattoo shop that would question, why are you getting a tattoo? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know who this guy is unless it's like his parole officer who's like, don't get a tattoo, don't get a tattoo, and followed him the whole way to the parlor. Dern adds that the tattoo wards off evil spirits, and the guy's like, see, this guy knows. It wards off evil spirits, there you go. As he finishes up with the man, a pair of young girls come in. One of them is played by a young Cynthia Nixon. Dern asks for their ID, and they try to bribe him into skipping that step. It's very simple. I don't do minors. That night, we see him walking the streets, and he picks up a magazine called Contessa and admires the model on the cover played by Maude Adams. The same girls approach him again, this time offering their bodies in a different way. Look, I told you once, I don't do minors. He pops into a friend's diner to see if he has any messages. Apparently, in lieu of a personal phone number, he pays the guy who owns this place to use his phone, even though later we'll learn he has, like, an intense distrust of public phones. Yeah. It's like, then get a phone, dude. Get a phone that only you use. Why are you using a public phone for every phone call? Kind of reminded me of uh, Play Misty for me. Where, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, he, using the bartender to yeah. keep Yeah, I think messages. Defiance, uh, he did that too, where he uh, he went into the local grocery store and he was like, hey, can I use your phone? And he's like, yeah, I'll shout up to you when a call comes oh, in. Oh, right, right, yeah. On the TV in the diner, he spots the same model in a commercial for Aphrodite Perfume. Right then, a call comes in for Dern, or Carl Kinski, as we'll come to know him. It's someone named Doris calling with an emergency. Carl takes a cab to the beach and walks out to a gazebo over the water. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a gazebo over the water? Yeah, that was the prowler. That's right. He looks from the dock over to a house on the beach. On the porch, he is greeted by a sobbing Doris, who describes someone's traumatic death, and we hard cut to a funeral of presumably Carl's father. The voice of his father echoes in his head, picking on his choice of career and his dumb little drawings. He holds in his hands a framed photo of someone, either his father or himself as a young boy, and he silences the echoes by punching the glass and shattering it. So this must be his father as a kid? I guess. He tosses the shards of glass on a nearby chair and walks out of the room. We cut to Carl and several family members eating pie around a table. The family put Carl in charge of selling the beach house and agree to take Carl's mother in to live with them somewhere out of town. Now, they don't seem to think much of Carl, so why are they putting him in charge of selling the house? Because it's the easiest part. <laughs> they, they don't trust him to keep their mom alive, but they're like, who cares really about this house? We can uh, split the money. I don't want the money. Let her have my share. He didn't leave her anything else. Well, if you'd helped him out in the store, maybe he could have made something out of it. Carl's mother doesn't appreciate this shot at her dead husband and blames Carl's hobby and refusal to work for his father for the failure of the family business. We cut back to the tattoo parlor where Carl has been asked to tattoo a woman's legs spread wide open across a man's armpit. When the hairs grow in, it's really going to look like something. <laughs> it wasn't my idea. It's like, yeah, you should already have that hair by now, sir. How old are you? Well, I, I imagine they had to Sh shave no, it. I, yeah, probably. But also, it won't because it won't. it's much bigger than the area yeah. you're trying to cover. You're gonna it's going to look trim like it way down. Not yeah. much of anything. Oh, yeah. oh my God. That's, that <laughs> is now a hilarious picture in my mind. He's just going to have four hairs sticking e out of it. Every the... week he has to strategically shave this into a tiny spot tiny in under bush. his armpit. Like, how yeah. weird is that going to be? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, well, because it should have been like one leg down his side and one leg down, down his, his arm. arm yeah but instead it's a tiny little woman yeah. like a little <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he's got fucking thumbelina in his armpit <laughs> just then a woman enters to speak with carl and is disturbed a bit by the tattoo he's currently applying well also she's she's like he's working like right. he he's into you she's know, like leaning over him to yeah ask and, him and like saying can I talk to you? Cause it's like, are you busy? Like, it's like, yeah, I'm freaking busy. Yeah. What does it look like? She introduces herself as Sandra Benson and says she's here to represent new fashion magazine. Who's doing a feature on Kenji's bathing suit collection. They had the bright idea to hire Kinski to apply a temporary form of his distinctive tattoo style on the girls modeling the line. Carl seems annoyed at the request, but we cut right to a board meeting where Kinski has brought samples of his work and they're thrilled to be working with him. So it's like he's playing it cool here, but he also really wants this job. Sandra seems a bit embarrassed by how her coworkers are talking about Kinski's work, but Carl is distracted when he notices a photo in a pile of headshots and realizes that Maude Adams, or Maddie Summers as we'll come to know her, is one of the girls he'll be working with. That night, 
Carl works on some designs to apply to the girls and starts with a sketch of Maddie in particular. The next day, he is led to a dressing room full of models. Everyone's here but Maddie, who will be made up later in the day. We get a montage of the photos being taken by a photographer named Halsey. Maddie finally arrives and is led through the dressing room to Carl's corner of it. He seems freaked out as he awaits her arrival. She apologizes for her tardiness and says she slept in because she has to medicate herself to get any sleep because her boyfriend keeps her up all night. She sits with Carl and he gets right to work. Maddie already seems excited to be painted on and she strokes his tattoos and compliments them. He reminds her repeatedly to relax. She says she's a fan of his work and it reminds her of the works of Kitagawa Udamaro. He seems impressed that she has any familiarity at all with the classical Japanese artists. Carl reminds her to relax again to make the drawing easier, but Sandra does everything she can to prevent any relaxation. Be relaxed. Relax? She's on in 40 minutes or Halsey will throw a fit. We get a montage of Maddie's photo shoot, and when it wraps up, Carl hides in the shadows of the dressing room and eavesdrops on a conversation between Maddie and her boyfriend. I mean, uh, before we get too far, like, I feel like I should address the fact that anybody that actually cares about real tattoo culture and styles and stuff like this would probably be very annoyed by this movie. Yeah. Because this photo shoot they're like yeah we're gonna have a bunch of uh of girls in here and they're going to be like wearing sailor outfits and stuff like yeah. that and we're like maybe we could do some anchors or maybe you could put a dragon on her i'm like no 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 anchors no. and dragons no, 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 don't no, no, really no. go Those together two different styles you cannot mix like american traditional tattooing with classic japanese tattooing like yeah. those are two different things those are very distinct and the vibe you're giving off is wrong when you're putting like Sailor suits on Sailors on one person and like an, and eagles and anchors and then the person next to them has a big old dragon on them and the person next to them is covered in like florals. It's like this is not how this works. Yeah, no. None of these people seem to be in the same tattoo world. I mean, I get the celebration of tattoos as like an art piece for a magazine. Right. But, and, and you can have a variety of tattoos and something like that, but then you don't dress them up like sailors. Yeah, but even <laughs> when they're in the board meeting, Halsey even says, what's more Japanese than tattoos? Then it's like, okay, then they all need to be Japanese-style tattoos. Right, and don't put them in sailor outfits. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it was supposed to be a swimsuit collection, right? Right. It's a topless swimsuit. This is a two-piece, but I'm only wearing the bottom half. <laughs> so half of the swimsuit is missing. It's a two-piece, but the two pieces are the bottom half. Yeah. It's two separate pieces. <laughs> that are stitched together on the sides, just like every other bottom. We get a montage of Maddie's photo shoot, and when it wraps up, Carl hides in the shadows of the dressing room and eavesdrops on a conversation between Maddie and her boyfriend. The boyfriend says he has to work tonight, and she's annoyed because he keeps her up all night with his nonsense. She showers off all the temp tattoos, and they leave together. Carl washes what's left of her body paint down the shower drain. Maddie returns to the dressing room with the photographer, Halsey, and she tries flirting with him, but he says his wife is waiting, and he's committed to her, so Maddie turns to Carl and asks him to take her to dinner. We cut right to them arriving at a restaurant together. All of Carl's attempts at chivalry are awkward and abrasive. When the maitre d' tries to pull out Maddie's chair, Carl insists on doing it himself. But the biggest red flag here is when she tries to place a drink order and he demands she tell him first so he can relay it to the waiter himself. Thankfully, the waiter embarrasses Carl with his own stupidity. It sounds like he was about to fuck up her order anyway. The lady will have a Bloody Mary with... I heard. <laughs> He's just like, <laughs> shut up, sir. This is dumb. I mean, he could have taken it one step further and be like, no, 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 no. You don't want a Bloody Mary. You are going to have um, yeah. such a such. Well, it's going to be less calories. Literally, <laughs> the only reason to force her to tell you so that you can tell someone else is so that you can change the order or so that you can control her. That's literally all that means. Yeah. And so, fuck that guy. <laughs> they talk about Carl's work before tattooing, and he mentions some time spent disinfecting public telephones. You do that for a little while and you uh, never want to put your mouth to a receiver again. <laughs> Which explains why when we saw him using the phone earlier, he had a napkin on it at least. But it's like, just use a private phone. Yeah, it's, and, and it's like, you disinfect them. You're making them clean. Yeah. Like, that's a job that you're doing so that your public phones will be clean. Right. It's not going to be like that Hitchhiker's Guide side story about that whole planet that went extinct because of a dirty telephone <laughs> they, they sent all the, the whole concept was that they sent all their useless people into space like 
the people who sanitize telephones and, and sweep the streets. It's like, we don't need these people. <laughs> and then they, their unsanitized telephone killed the whole planet. Yeah. <laughs> An acquaintance named Albert drunkenly joins their table and asks where her boyfriend Buddy is before turning to judge Carl by his profession. What do you do? If you don't mind my asking. Mr. Kinski. I'm a tattoo artist. You're putting me on. The man goes off on a tangent about how much pussy tattoo artists get, and Carl is offended by his language and orders the man away. What are you going to do, hit me? When I really don't like someone, I don't hit them. I kill them. Albert sweeps the table clear with his arm, and Carl and Maddie leave together for some reason. She should not have said another word to this man, but for yeah. some reason she's flattered by Carl's actions. I feel like I'm out with Sir Galahad. Did Sir Galahad threaten to murder innocent people all the time? She asks him to accompany her home. She invites him in for a meal, but then he says he has to catch the last train home and turns around. Instead of the train, he heads straight up to a strip club and puts a coin into a strip show booth. As he gives the dancer strict instructions, the music gets louder and the picture fades to black. The next day, Maddie is working on a film set beside a river and Carl approaches her with flowers on set. He tells her that her skin still looks tense and she needs a better diet. He recommends Japanese food because he's an incurable weeaboo. He promises to cook her a nice Japanese meal in his Hoboken apartment tonight, and she agrees to take a taxi to his place. I feel like, you know, it's it, maybe it's not better now, but at least it's more understood now that these kinds of actions from people are are meant to be controlling but you know the the rhetoric made women believe you know that it was in the 80s that yeah it's like yeah. oh you're you're doing this to be kind and to protect me and all yeah, this this stuff. is what a man is supposed to do he's supposed to threaten to murder my friends in a restaurant <laughs> yeah carl lives upstairs from his tattoo shop and she is invited to enter through the store after hours she compliments his framed work mounted all over the store she thinks his work is better than the usual stuff but he admits he has to do the normal stuff too to keep the lights on in particular, she likes a full-body tattoo on a male model and asks if women ever get tattoos like that. He says he does for women who need the mark. Why do you call it the mark? Because that's what it is. He invites her upstairs, and she seems to enjoy the meal he's prepared. While they eat, they listen to some of Maddie's boyfriend's music, and he tells her the music is no good, and neither is the guy because he fondles her in public. She asks what he thinks love is, and he thinks it's a shield to protect women from outsiders. But it sounds more like he means it's a tool to separate women from the outside world. He says women would be happier with a little old-fashioned protector for a man. She gets a little flirtier with him, and he asks if she's proposing intercourse, and explains that he's big on monogamy, so she'll have to commit to an exclusive arrangement, and this whole proposal seems to strike Maddie out of nowhere. She tells him that his ways are antiquated, and fucking has changed, but he flips out at her language. Sex fucking? People don't make commitments when they fuck anymore. No. Fucking's not the end of the- Don't use that word. That word sounds ugly in your mouth. He tells her to get out of his apartment. She's shocked by this bizarre treatment, and for the short walk to her taxi, he begs her for another date. He makes her promise to meet him at a Japanese exhibit at the Met later in the week. The cab driver can tell she's freaked out by the guy, and speeds away. When she gets home, the phone is already ringing, and it's Carl calling to see if the cab driver bothered her at all because he couldn't stand the thought of leaving her in the care of another man just now. He calls her back repeatedly, demanding to talk in person tonight, and she's obviously not interested. She makes every possible excuse and reiterates that she will see him at the exhibit when she is suddenly surprised by her boyfriend Buddy's arrival. Yes, I know where it is. I know. Oh! Oh, God, you scared me. Please don't call me anymore tonight, okay? Why? What? Okay. <laughs> why would you still agree to ever see him again? Yeah. And why would you qualify that with the word tonight? <laughs> don't I think, just don't yeah. ever call me again and tell somebody that this creepo is really getting to you. Yeah, and I do feel like she even here doesn't intend to meet him at the museum. I, I guess maybe she's just placating him. But to just to get him to leave her alone. Sure, maybe. Yeah. But at the same time, like, he's doing enough here that I think is threatening It's enough. crossing the line to, no, I'm not going to go to the thing and please don't call mm -hmm. me again. Well, it's threatening enough that I think you should be telling people that you're concerned about this man who's suddenly become Very obsessive with yeah. you and 
you need you 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 feel a little unsafe and you're like yep. look i'm i'm not going to show up but he might get upset about this yeah in his apartment he replays tapes that the magazine provided him of maddie's modeling work the next day he waits outside the met where he was set to meet with maddie sandra from the magazine shows up in her place and says something came up and she can't make it she reminds him that the magazine will need the vcr and tapes returned Sandra offers to stay and check out the exhibition with him, but Carl clearly doesn't consider anyone other than Maddie to be a real person and can't see that Sandra is legitimately interested in him. He thanks her for relaying the message for Maddie and never even acknowledges her offer to join him today before he walks away. We cut to Maddie in bed with her boyfriend and the phone rings, but the caller hangs up when he answers the phone. Do you guys recall the last time a boyfriend answered the phone and got hung up on oh, without yeah. hearing the caller? I, I think I got it. What do you got? The French lieutenant's woman? That's right. Who was that? I don't know who put the phone down. Carl watches their apartment from across the street for hours. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just like, there are phones in that one? Oh, the, the modern day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Later in the afternoon, Carl rings the doorbell and asks to see Maddie. He won't take no for an answer and jams his foot in the door when the boyfriend parrots the excuse about her being out of town. He tells Carl that he heard from Maddie that he couldn't get it up for her and suggests Carl get himself straightened out before he bothers her again. Back at the diner, Carl's friend gives him the last slice of pie from behind the counter and relays some phone messages. Sandra called again to ask about that VCR and he got a few responses on the listing for his father's house, which he promised his family he'd sell. Carl asks the man to break some bills into quarters so that he can use the payphone. At first I thought he was going to take him back down to the strip club. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what I thought too. He leaves a message for Maddie. You have 20 seconds to record your message. Uh, I know you're there, Maddie. But if you don't want to speak to me, I can understand. Uh, I waited all week for Sunday and I was very disappointed when you didn't show up. Maddie, you must not confide in other people. The fuck does that mean? <laughs> Don't talk to humans. Later, a couple arrive to do a walkthrough at the beach house, and the whole scene plays out like a weird montage and super fast dissolves from yeah. one shot to the next. They're all like one or two seconds long. Eventually, the enthusiasm of the buyers for the property convinces Carl that he should instead keep the house and live here since it's so nice. Well, I, I no. don't I don't think that that's that's yeah. what he's thinking. Well, that's part of it because they're like, oh, I like this view. And then he like looks at the view after they leave and he's just like, yeah, this is a nice view. I mean, I yeah, I definitely think that it's he had, he just had a change of heart about the, the use of this yeah. location. That this could this would make a great kidnap shack. Yeah. Also, they didn't know how much the house was selling for. It's like, right. Why, why would yeah. you even go to a house that you don't know what the price is? <laughs> I make the same note. At the end of the tour, they ask the price, and he breaks it to them that he's decided against selling. They flip out on him because they drove a long way. The woman points out that she is quite pregnant, and they called in advance to avoid wasting their gas money and time. At this point, I felt sorry for the buyers, but then the lady says some more stuff. And we were counting on this house for the summer. I need the sea air. Yeah, what do you think? I need the iodine. No, what do you think you're trying to pull, man? Yeah, I'm sorry. The iodine is free, lady. Get the fuck out of my house <laughs> and breathe that shit in. <laughs> And you only want the place for the summer? What does that even mean? You're going to buy a house, squirt a baby into it, and then move out? What? <laughs> well, that's just You great. dumb son of a bitch, keep your fucking house. I will, mister. Uh, yeah, that's the plan. I literally just told you that. <laughs> On the way out, Carl offers to reimburse their gas cost, and suddenly the guy doesn't care about the gas money because it was a bullshit complaint in the first place. If I decided not to sell, I probably would have just said... The place is $110 billion right. <laughs> because who does a whole hour long walkthrough montage before even asking the price? I wouldn't even go in the front door before I knew what it cost. Yeah, that, that seems to be the less confrontational. Just like give him a much higher price. Yeah. Rip him off <laughs> and then go buy two go, beach houses go, go, down the yeah, street. Yeah, exactly. Two kidnap shacks. <laughs> <laughs> Carl speaks with his family on the phone and assures his sister Doris that he's just waiting for the right offer. We cut back to Maddie's place and she's woken by her boyfriend's light jazz band practicing in the living room. Honestly, the music is so chill and well performed this wouldn't even annoy me. It would probably help me sleep. But she angrily gets out of bed, totes nude, and throws on a robe to yell at her boyfriend. She kicks them all out of the apartment and the whole band is very cool about it. She moves around the room tidying up after they leave when the doorbell rings. 
In my head, I literally imagined Carl just bursting into chloroform her, but this isn't that kind of movie. Oh, fuck, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my note as well. Carl fucking chloroforms her. <laughs> Jesus Christ. He throws a rag over her face and squeezes it tight against her head until she passes out. He packs her bags and then loads her into his car and drives her out to the beach house. He packs them very well, too. I was very impressed with Well, that. I think he's trying to make it look convincing. That's why yeah. he's taking random doodads and tucking them into the suitcase. Like she's, like, like she's going away. She's thinking about it. And mm-hmm. she's purposely getting all her stuff that she wants. Yeah. And nobody's going to come looking. He carries her into a small room and lays her across a table. He opens her robe and begins tattooing her while she sleeps under a psycho shower stabbing score. <laughs> The next morning, Maddie wakes to the delicious iodine breeze and looks around the room slowly. (laughs) She's spooked to find Carl watching her from a chair at the foot of the bed. Amazingly, she doesn't immediately reach for her aching rib cage from the hours and hours of tattoo work she has endured while unconscious. She asks where her clothes are and he points to the closet. She whips off the robe to get dressed and spots her reflection in a nearby full-length mirror. The line work for a large tattoo has been drawn up her chest, between her breasts, and around her neck over the shoulder. As a model, she is basically unemployable now. At first, she thinks it's painted on like before, but when she can't wipe it off, she has a complete breakdown. She tries to attack him, and seemingly out of nowhere, she's holding a big glass ball and hurls it at the mirror, breaking it into thousands of shards. She sobs over the shards on the floor and asks why he didn't just kill her. She tries to make a quick escape, but he blocks her way. How long are you going to be here? Until it's finished. She faints from the trauma of the situation, and he carries her back into the bed and starts sweeping up all the broken mirror shards. We see him collect all but one. Do you guys recall the last time we saw someone clean up every shard but one from a shattered mirror? I think so. Is it that one where everything got glowy? Like the mirrors got glowy? Uh That's the name of that movie. I feel like the name of the movie wasn't super relevant to the actual movie. A kid shouts it right before his neck snaps in a window. Oh, God. That was the best. I don't remember the name. Boogeyman! Boogeyman. He returns to work on the tattoo, and hours later she wakes up again with Carl right beside her. She asks how he chose her, and he says he loves her. And either from that or the shock again, she starts vomiting. Carl rushes her to the bathroom sink and explains that the vomiting is actually a side effect of a sedative he's been injecting her with, and that the vomiting will only get worse and might even kill her if she doesn't learn to start cooperating. Look, if you'll stop fighting me, then I won't have to give you any more shots. It's a second home, Maddie. Too much of it can kill you, and I couldn't bear that. She tries to run out of the house again, but he catches up with her in the basement and wrestles her into a closet as punishment. He tells her nobody cares as much about her as he does, and she assures him he is mistaken. That afternoon, he drags her to a phone booth and makes her call people and explain her absence as vaguely as possible. That night, he chops up a meal for her. He tells her there's no use in trying to escape and even screaming is a waste of time. It's funny, you know, when I was real little, I used to hate the wind because it could howl louder than I could scream. Now it's kind of like a friend or an accomplice (laughs) yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) nice he steps away to get her a sweater and she sneaks the knife on the table when he returns with one she tries to attack him and he disarms her he tries to make her feel bad for attacking him like maybe she isn't worthy of this important gift he's bestowing upon her she admits that the gift is a special one and begs him to forgive her and finish the mark as long as he doesn't hurt her then you mustn't hurt me because if i hurt my skin Carl agrees to her terms. The next day, we see him arrive home with groceries and go to retrieve Maddie from the closet again. Suddenly, someone is buzzing obnoxiously at the door and we see a family on the porch. Stop ringing, Harry! There's nobody home! The wife is annoyed by her husband's persistent buzzing at a clearly empty home and her children are scampering around the property like crazy people. I feel like he would have said, I just saw the guy go in with two grocery bags. Yeah. It took us 20 minutes to get these kids out of the car. She finally convinces her husband to leave when the kids push her over the edge. Come on. I can't stand them anymore. The family leave and Maddie lays down to allow Carl to continue his work. 
When he leaves the room for a moment, she slowly gets up, and he suddenly addresses her through a peephole in the door. He gives her instructions, like he did to the stripper toward the start of the film, to lay on her back and touch herself, and she complies with his demands to a point. But eventually she breaks and rushes the door to shout at him that she won't follow his disgusting commands anymore. Instead of reprimanding her, Carl seems embarrassed to be called out for his perversions. Then, she takes an insane turn and demands he touch her and have sex with her, instead of performing remotely through a door. Why could you be a man, for Christ's sake? Body's not committed yet, Maddie. <gasps> she runs to her room and sits in the corner, from which she notices the mirror shard under the bed and her eyes go wide. Carl enters to help her into bed. He tells her good night. When he closes the door, she sneaks out of bed and picks up the shard to inspect it for a few seconds, and then cuts open her finger with it as a funny prank on herself. What are you doing? You don't know how glass works? You're an adult. Trying to test how sharp it is, I think. I could tell by looking at things how sharp they are. I have eyeballs. The next morning, Carl enters her room and she's not there. He panics and runs around the house looking for her and finds her sitting nonchalantly at the breakfast table. When he admits he thought she left, she pretends not to have even thought about it. But then again, maybe she didn't because for some fucking reason she's still here. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you leave? She just acts like they're two normal people in a consensual relationship together for a minute. That night, they sit on a couch and watch movies together. Maddie makes a bed for herself out of blankets and pillows on the floor. She hides the mirror shard under the corner of the blanket and tests herself to see how she can retrieve it when Carl isn't in the room. This is where Carl does the next session of tattoo work. She strokes his hair to distract him and then reaches for the shard, but just as she gets a hand on it, the tattoo gun hits a nerve and Maddie has a sudden painful muscle contraction and can't control herself. Carl helps her wait it out and breathe to relax the spasming muscle. When Carl moves to stand up, he feels the shard under the blanket and picks it up. He apologizes for missing it earlier, as she could have cut herself, and she bursts into tears. Carl tries to comfort her and tells her he loves her, unclear if he even understands what's just happened. We get a montage of time passing in the house, and one day, the tattoo is done. Maddie is so ecstatic to hear the news that she stands up so Carl can remove her robe and reveal the finished mark. Now that she bears his mark, Carl is prepared to consummate the relationship and undresses himself so they can lay down together on the floor and finally have sex. As I mentioned before, Dern has claimed repeatedly that this sex scene was not simulated, while Adams has insisted the opposite. We see them rolling over each other and a lot of thrusting for a while. Maddie makes some sounds as if approaching climax, but then, coming to her senses at the last minute, screams for Carl to stop until finally her hands find the tattoo gun that Carl set down on the floor, and she raises it high in the air and stabs it deep into Carl's back, deep enough to kill him with a single stab. Pretty impressive. He lets out an orgasmic death scream and then collapses under more footage from his days in Japan, and we freeze frame on Maddie sitting up over his body in the room and the credits roll. It kind of it kind of feels really skeezy that he's saying that that's a real sex scene, whether it is or not. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's which, why I'm sure it's not. Which I just, but that really bothers me in terms of my my opinion of Bruce Dern. It it, it jives with my opinion of Bruce okay. Dern. <laughs> <laughs> I just. I, I think he is the character in this movie and in Middle Age Crazy and in everything I've ever seen him in. Like he always plays a pathetic person. And there's, there has, it's not a coincidence that every character he's ever played has been a pathetic old man. I, yeah, well, I mean, he, he does like, he, he's a, he does it really well in Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he's a pathetic old man. Yeah. And everything. Anyway, that's Tattoo. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> it's pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. I was. There's also not much story to it. Ugh. I was, I was not expecting this. I didn't want this. No. I mean, it's not poorly made, and I don't even think it's poorly written. I, th I think it's accurate to the tropes of this kind of a person. It's just disgusting, and it's not enjoyable to watch. No, not no. at all. Um, but I have to imagine, so the director had sat down with uh, Joyce Boonwell and said, Here's the story, and I can't imagine his story was much more than what ended up in the script, which is a tattoo artist falls in love with a model, and he kidnaps her and tattoos her for a while, and then when he finishes the tattoo, they have sex and she kills him. 
because that's the entire story that's not mm-hmm. an abbreviation of what happened that's everything that happened there's there's not much more detail to the story yeah. than that so i don't know what the script added other than you film them having sex for a while here but yeah it just seems like a very uncomplicated story um i think it's a thumbs down for me just because it's that unenjoyable to watch it's not badly made and i don't even think it's badly written it's just ugh, gross no thank you uh i'm surprised you had to think that hard about it it's definitely a thumbs down for me yeah that's a thumbs down i am conflicted because it's not bad filmmaking the problem is that it's a disgusting character and is that a flaw of the filmmaking okay but it's not i don't think it's good filmmaking either sure i i think that it is mediocre filmmaking in terms of yeah okay your lighting was fine your your camera work was fine you know like i'm just saying like there was nothing particularly wrong with it but right. it also wasn't great well it, i think i do and think it's, it's not an- great and it's not great storytelling because i don't i don't feel like they are saying anything particularly interesting about these things just, i think they are just that they exist i think it's an interesting character study of this incel persona that hasn't really been explored to this extent other than what the fan that we had earlier this season like there when we have villain characters like this i think it's important to draw them up and shape them for people to see so that maybe some girl saw this movie and then a few weeks later when a guy offered to place her drink order she was like Hey, that's a red flag now, I know, because... Fair. Yeah. Fair in terms of the time period in which it was made, because I'm looking at it now, and I'm like, there's much better versions of uh, incel movies. Right. Right? Um, So that's fair, but I also genuinely, like, a lot of times when I look at these movies in... I am looking at it in the context of, like, no, this has been done better. Like, I, I don't really care for this version of it. Yeah. And I I do worry going through the movie like the whole time that the moral of the story is going to be that she falls for this guy. Like too many times I was worried that that's how that's the direction they were taking. It's not where it ends up, obviously. And she's not celebrating having murdered him enough for my taste. Like she seems upset about it at the end. And I mean, maybe you would if you just took a person's life for any reason. But I still feel like I would have liked for her to be like, yeah, fuck you, and just keep smashing him with this tattoo gun. One one stab isn't going to kill him anyway. Yeah, how does she manage to kill him with one little stab just, of something yeah, the size well of a pen? Well-placed, I guess. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think that the uh, the shard of glass was going to do it either, but that's when you're just like, you got to run, lady. Like, I yeah. don't think that's enough. Well, well the had- glass you slit the throat open with. Yeah. But she had an opportunity to run. She didn't take it. Yeah. But, I mean... I think she could have gotten out that front door that morning. Like, that's why he was panicking, is that... Yeah, no, that's exactly She could have left, and she chose not to because she wanted to stay and kill him. Richard, what do you think in Letterboxd? Uh, I have it pretty low. I have it at 129, uh, which puts it below Final Exam and above Just a Gigolo. I have it just two below. I have it at 131. That's under Tuck Everlasting and above Rich and Famous last week's film Sorry. Uh, I have it at 135 it is below so fine and above smoky bites the dust that's fair our story was written by director Bob Brooks he's mostly a commercial director with thousands of high profile advertisements to his credit no other feature film credits the writer here was Joyce Bunuel. She's the daughter-in-law of celebrated Spanish surrealist filmmaker Luis Bunuel. Not many other credits I recognized. The music here was from Barry Devorzon. He's a composer on The Warriors, The Ninth Configuration, Xanadu, and Private Benjamin so far. Back this season for Looker and later Exorcist 3. Cinematographer Arthur J. Ornitz was a DP on A Thousand Clowns, House of Dark Shadows, The Anderson Tapes, Minion and Moskowitz, and Death Wish. The other cinematographer, Michael Sarazin, who, isn't that the name of an actor, too? Michael Sarazin? Uh, I don't know. Michael Sarah. <laughs> no, I'm thinking of Michael Sarazin, but I think maybe it's spelled differently. But uh, he was the cinematographer for the Tokyo portion. He's also the cinematographer for Bugsy Malone, Midnight Express, Foxes, Fame, and later Rambo 3, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, Parisia Tame, Step Up, 
and more recently, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, War for the Planet of the Apes, Mowgli Legend of the Jungle, and Gunpowder Milkshake. Editor Tom Noble later cuts Red Dawn, Witness, Poltergeist 2, Exorcist 3, Thelma and Louise, The Hudsucker Proxy, Reign of Fire, Red, and the Point Break reboot. I think he got better at his job because I actually think the editing is the one thing I'll admit was kind of shoddily mm. done in this film. Bruce Dern played Carl Kinski. Dern is in literally hundreds of things, but I'll mention The Burbs, Nebraska, Silent Running, Black Sunday. A lot of low-budget work with Corman, like The Trip and Psych Out. We saw him last season in Middle Age Crazy, and his daughter Laura made her feature film debut in White Lightning earlier this season. We also had him in a Patreon review of The Incredible Two-Headed Transplant, and I have a credit with Dern in Tarantino's Hateful Eight, though my name is misspelled in the credits. <laughs> Thank you, Quentin. Maude Adams played Maddie. She was Andrea Anders in The Man with the Golden Gun with a different tattoo, her mm -hmm. baby Achez. And then returned to the franchise later in Moore's run as Octopussy in Octopussy. She's also Ella in Rollerball, Nadine in Angel 3, The Final Chapter, and Fema in Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, Initiation. Leonard Frey played Halsey. We've seen him so far as a desk clerk in Where the Buffalo Roam and Keck in Up the Academy. John Getz played Buddy. He was Stathis Barans in The Fly and The Fly 2. He's Gus in Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, General Hammond in Xenon the Sequel, and Paul Jobs in Jobs, father of Ashton Kutcher's Steve Jobs. Peter Iacangelo played Dubin. We've seen him so far as Zoo in Hoodlums and Plainclothes Cop in Times Square. On his IMDb page, the only role I recognized is his final credit as Lou in Fight Club. You don't know where I've been, Lou. Oh my god! <laughs> you don't know where I've been! <laughs> Please let us stay, Lou. <laughs> Cynthia Nixon played Cindy. We've seen her so far in Little Darlings and Prince of the City. She was also on Sex in the City and the recent sequel series, whatever that's called. And she's the future mayor of New York City, maybe, who knows. Trisha Doolin played Cheryl. She was Donna in Neon Maniacs. Jane Hoffman played Teresa. She was Mrs. Oddlish in Day of the Locust. Muriel Hoganson, or Hoganson, in Batteries Not Included, and Mrs. Baxter in In and Out. Robert Burr played Ralph. He's Lieutenant Haynes in The Seven Ups, and Android in Angel of Heat, H-E-A-T. John Snyder played Hawker. He's a voice actor in a lot of American dubs of animes like Daisuke Jigen in Lupin the Third, Cliff Skeezer in Trigun, Bob on Cowboy Bebop. He's the voice of Takeshi Kitano in Battle Royale's American dub. He's Admiral Hermes in Star Ocean, Cow Cow in Dynasty Warriors, Sid in Final Fantasy IX, E Honda in Street Fighters 4 and 5, and Thrym in Sword Art Online. Kevin O'Rourke played Texan. He was Spencer Tracy in The Aviator. Sally Jane Height played Margaret. She was the Bergdorf shopper in So Fine, who Jack Warden tried to peddle his wares to. Kate McGregor Stewart played Pregnant Wife. She was Mrs. Lemons in School of Rock. Joanna McKenzie in Father of the Bride 1 and 2. And Lady Censor in Scrooged. I want to see her nipples. <laughs> Charles Dickens would have wanted to see her nipples. That's the woman who can't stand her children on the porch no that's the lady who needs iodine yeah richard mcgonagall played texan friend number one he's a narrator of 500 days of summer he played president johnson in metal gear solid 3 he's general grievous on the clone wars he's the voice of victor sullivan in uncharted 2 3 and 4 and he's the narrator voice on the marvelous misadventures of flapjack richard mcgonagall that's a great name who was texan's friend who was texan this is Texan's friend. Right, but who is Texan? No, this is Texan's friend. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Texan friend? This guy's friend. Remember the guy who's hanging out with McGonagall? <laughs> I'm assuming Texan is the guy getting the tattoo at the beginning. Okay. And so Texan's oh, friend so is the guy who's who, like, why are you getting a tattoo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Also, watch Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack. I'm just practicing for a job I won't have for another 40 years. Or 30, probably closer to 30. Those are all the credits I have for this one. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord. 
Join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Ticket to Heaven, which IMDb describes like so. David is a young man seduced by a religious cult that uses starvation, exhaustion, and brainwashing to mold recruits into money-hustling disciples of a messiah-like leader. Wait, didn't we just watch that movie? Basically. Chronicles David's chilling transformation into a gaunt, mindless shadow of his former self and his ultimate salvation when his friends and family launch a plan to kidnap and deprogram him. Oh, okay. I was going to say, this is very similar to the Force 5 stuff, right? It is similar to the Force 5 premise, yeah. And other stuff that I've covered, like uh, the mini-sode review I did of Guiana Cult of the Damned. Very similar story. We'll leave you now with a trailer, if there is one, for Ticket to Heaven. children bow. On his reign, in his reign.